Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast has evolved over the five plus years since it first launched. From now on, I'm going to be talking about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. And also mindset, of course, but mindset of all kinds, not just business mindset. I think. Things are changing for me, as you may have noticed if you've been following me online or listening to this podcast, so anything goes here. I hope you stay along for the ride. Thank you so much for joining us today, and now let's get into this week's episode. Hello and welcome to the End of the Woods podcast, episode 366. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another co-hosted episode with the fabulous Joanna Hennon. Today we are talking about Midlife. This is actually really funny that we ended up on this topic because we started out not knowing what we were going to talk about. And when we were evaluating different topics, we both agreed that we wanted to talk about something lighter (laughs) because we've both been looking for kind of some more lighter topics in the podcast that we listen to, kind of more entertaining things. And then somehow we ended up back where we always are in like deep, reflective, personal development stuff. So this week we are talking about midlife, reevaluating where you are and where you want to go for the second half of your life. Except these points of reevaluation can happen at any point in our lives. It doesn't have to be a midlife crisis or a quarter life crisis. It could be when you turn 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. There are points in our lives when we naturally stop and pause and think, where am I? What am I doing? And where do I want to be headed for the rest of my life or the next year or next decade or whatever? So this may be relevant to you, even if you're not in your mid 40s or 50s. So let's look at what we're going to talk about, what you will learn in this episode. We answer the questions, when is midlife? What is it? And we talk about why it's not necessarily between the age of 45 and 60 or 40 and 65 or whatever it is that people say it is when you look online. We answer the question, what does it look like? How does it feel? How to know when it's time to reevaluate your life? What to do when you look at your life and you wonder, whose life am I living? And finally, how to be happy when you're in that place of dissatisfaction. And that can be really, really hard. When you get to a point in your life where you realize, I don't want this, I don't want that, I'm totally dissatisfied, I'm totally unfulfilled, how do you turn that around? And how do you start to be happy when you're in that place where everything feels like shit? So that's what we talk about today. And again, this can happen at any point in your life. So I hope you find this episode interesting and useful. I think it's really juicy. And it's not the light and entertaining episode that we thought it was going to be, but I think it will be really useful. So without further ado, here is today's episode. Hey, Joanna. Hi, Holly. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Looking forward to today's conversation. (laughs) I think it's going to be a good one. Oh, I think so. Hope so. So today we're going to talk about hitting midlife, reevaluating where you are in life and where you want to be headed. And if You hear this and you think, oh, I'm not at my midlife. Maybe you are. Like, I never really thought about this until actually just the other day. I forget what I was reading or what I was thinking or what I was talking about. And it was like, I realized, like, I'm going to be 47 in a couple of weeks. Like, that's midlife. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm probably halfway through my life and I probably have, like, this, I'm probably moving into the second half. Like, this is huge. Yeah. I never really thought about it either. I actually didn't really realize that it exists like as a whole concept. And the way I judge whether something exists as a concept is whether it has a hashtag on Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) And so I was completely like shocked to find that it does have a hashtag on Instagram. And in fact, various loads of related hashtags. And there's a whole kind of community and movement around like how to handle this part of your life, this Mm. kind of middle part. I think about it like less as like the middle point and Mm. more like the middle bit. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a phase. It's not like we're going to live for 90 years. So 45 is midlife. Yeah. I mean, the last phase of your life will be hopefully some kind of old age. And this is kind of the bit before. You're not like a spring chicken anymore. You're not a teen. You're not in your 20s. Yeah, you're like in the middle bit. And like for women... 
the phases are really nicely laid out in traditional mythology mm. with the maiden, mother, mm. and the crone, mm. the three phases of woman. Mm -hmm. So like whether you're a mother or not, that middle bit is called the mother because mm. those are the years during which you can be and for various other reasons, but you're not a crone, right? Yeah. Like a crone is associated with like an older yeah. <laughs> woman, right? <laughs> I don't consider myself a crone. Me Do you neither. consider yourself oh, a crone? Oh, God, no. <laughs> Good. No, no. And I think that's interesting because I'm not a mother. I didn't resonate with that for a while. And it took me a long time to realize that like the mother phase is not just mother of babies or children. It's like mother of creative projects. I don't know, but the word still doesn't resonate with me because I've never wanted to be a mother. Yeah, I guess it's that fertile yeah. period. You can be, hmm. and you take it like not literally, then yeah. of course you can. I mean, I hate talking about things in this way, but of course, like you can birth other things. And yeah. I guess like it's that period in your life where you have experience hmm. and you can create and you can yeah. create life and you can create other things. Hmm. So when is midlife? Like we were just looking at kind of the age range and we've briefly touched upon that. 40s, 50s? Yeah, I think so. Like, I mean, I think it kind of depends because like, it just kind of depends on how your life went, yeah. really. Because you can have like some kind of identity crisis mm. type, midlife crisis type experience at any number of points in your life. And these can be triggered by any number of things. Like, mm. I didn't actually have a midlife thing when I turned 40, but I did when I turned 30. That was a really, really big mm. thing for me. And so my now husband, then boyfriend, was okay with me crying at my 30th birthday dinner, <laughs> as long as I promised that I wouldn't repeat that when I turned 40. And I happily am able to report <laughs> that 40 was a lot smoother <laughs> than 30. <laughs> but I think like, basically, midlife is like when you kind of realize that like some of the things you've put your focus on mm. and worked towards... Mm aren't like everything they haven't yeah. necessarily made you fully happy they haven't necessarily been super fulfilling like all those things that have been kind of sold to us as the be all end all of a good life when you achieve all or some of them and experience all of some of them you might find that actually there seems to be more and if there isn't more then that's a really fucking depressing thought mm. And I think that's where the emotional stuff comes in, because that is really depressing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It was like, I made this note about something that I read online. Someone had asked the question online, do you ever look at your life and wonder whose life am I living? And I think the people who get to that point and they ask themselves that question, it's people who have followed the rules in life. They thought, okay, well, you know, I'm supposed to get married, so I'll get married. I'm supposed to have kids, so I'll have kids. I'm supposed to have a cat and dog. I have a cat and dog. Like, I'm supposed to buy a house with a nice mortgage. I've got that. Like, they followed the rules in life, but those weren't necessarily the rules that they wanted to follow. Or they weren't all the rules. Yeah. Like, I did all those things. And it's not that I realized that I didn't want those things, mm. but I was very surprised when my son was small that I wasn't finding motherhood as fulfilling as I was supposed to. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. because you really wanted to be a mother. I really um, wanted to be a mother. And okay, so, so tell us briefly about that. I know that's very personal, but like, so what was that like? You really wanted to be a mother. You did it. You got the kid. He's a great kid, by the way. What was that like when it wasn't as fulfilling as you thought it was going to be? It was really hard. Yeah. Like, I felt like I was failing at it. Like, it's actually uh -huh. bringing tears to my eyes right now. Like, I just, like, the kind of, like, the point of being a woman was supposed to be that I became this mother. And, uh -huh. like, that was my natural purpose of my body and my life. I yeah. don't know. Like, it's weird. Yeah. That's how it's kind of sold to us, you know? And then, like, I had real trouble with various parts of it and I found it hard and boring mm. and a lot of other things <laughs> that maybe you should go, you know, in a memoir. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not that I didn't want to be a mother. That wasn't mm. it. It was that I didn't want to be just a mother yeah. and I didn't know like how to move past that. And mm. also like just the shock of realizing that this wouldn't give me what I'd been searching for. Yeah, that there was something more to search for. And I was so exhausted. I'm like, you know, like, but this was supposed to be it. Yeah, I don't have time for and anything not, else. Yeah, like I'm not feeling anything else. So 
I think for me, that was one of my points. I mean, I had several points that we mm. could call midlife experience, mm. but that was certainly one of them. And it le- that led to a whole change in my path. That's what ultimately led to me saying, actually, I don't want to do my job anymore. And actually, I need to find something else in life. Mm. Yeah, it was a really, really key moment and key process for me to, to think about life from that standpoint. Yeah, because I think fulfillment in life is made up of so many different things. It's not like if I have a great job, that's it. Or if I have a great kid, that's it. Like there are so many things that contribute to the richness of our lives. And I think like, I don't know, like, that's true. There is this richness. But we're not pointed towards richness. Mm. We're not encouraged to seek or find richness. We're encouraged and taught that there's like one way or maybe two or three ways. And that's already then awesome. Like if you have that choice of two or three ways. But there are certain like things. You gotta take the boxes. Like not only that you should do them, but that doing them Mm. is what's going to guarantee that you're going to die happy. I mean, that's what it is, right? Like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) that you're going to like get to the end of your life and say, wow, like that was fantastic. That's what we all want. Yeah. Yeah. But most of us like will then focus or most people will focus on the job and on Mm. the things they should do Mm. and on the guilt and all those things. And you're going to basically you're going to end up getting to the end of your life and being like, hmm, (laughs) I wonder if I should have made some different choices. (laughs) Yeah. I do not want to be in that place. God, that sucks. That is scary to me. When I realize that I'm pretty much midlife, probably. I mean, obviously, we don't know when we're going to die. I could die next week. But assuming I'm at more or less the midpoint in my life, and I've only got the second half of my life left, like that brings the concept of mortality to the forefront of my mind. Like, yeah, we know we're going to die at some point, but I feel like it has always felt so far off in the future that I didn't really think about it. But now it's like, well, like I've experienced the first half of my life. Like I really need to make the most of the second half of my life because I feel like there was a decade in there in like my mid 20s to mid 30s that I just shitty and I feel like I threw away a decade of my life. So I don't want to do that again. Like I want to be super conscious about how I live the rest of my life, whether that's one week, one year or 45 years. I've arrived at the same place, although from a slightly more morbid point of view. (laughs) So (laughs) because I have like, I think about death a lot. So I have, I guess, Aspie related death anxiety. Where I think about death like a disproportionate amount of time in various contexts. And actually, like one of the things that really helps me make decisions in life and like kind of really put things back in perspective and think about whether this is what I want to be doing, like truly, truly, is to imagine myself on my deathbed. So I imagine myself on my deathbed quite a lot. (laughs) (laughs) You didn't know this about me, Holly. No, I didn't. This is a new one. New neurosis, yeah. And then I just imagine, like, if I just continue with life the way it is now, Mm. will that be okay? Like, if Mm. I sometimes I imagine my deathbed when I'm 95 or something, and sometimes I kind of bring it sooner Mm. just to bring that reality of Mm. everything being impermanent closer so that I can make the right decisions for me about how I want to live my life. So it's a slightly morbid way of looking at soul alignment and like joy. <laughs> you should do a guided meditation for people. Imagine you're lying on your deathbed. Oh, yeah, that'd be lovely. The life is slowly draining from your body. Yeah, How okay, do you feel? Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think it's really, really useful. I think like I started yeah, I doing, when I read one of those articles about like uh, hospice staff conducting oh. interviews with dying patients yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah yeah about like what's important in life and I was like actually that's a really really good measure and I don't want to like get to the end of life and then realize it so I've been imagining it since then <laughs> yeah so I think it's actually really efficient that's what we're going to call it <laughs> it's an efficient way <laughs> to think about it but it's kind of helped me put a lot of things in perspective and it's ma- helped me make some choices. Most importantly, the choice to enjoy my life every single day, because yeah. I don't know when that deathbed situation is mm. happening or even if I'll have the luxury of that moment. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, cause, yeah. Yeah. So what I decided, and this was a long time ago now, so I've been in this kind of process for a long time, is to enjoy every single day as much as I can. So that if I don't wake up tomorrow, like it was an awesome last day. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. I've never really shared this with anybody. No, I like that. My weird brain. I like the concept of that. 
there's no point pretending that I'm always having awesome days. I'm not having an awesome day today at all. <laughs> but I'm aware enough that I know like once I get the stuff done that's like making my day not super awesome, I'm going to make sure to also include things that mm. make me feel really good mm -hmm. to spend time with my family, to have like a nice evening. We're currently watching MasterChef. Oh, <laughs> never seen that. Oh, we love MasterChef. Actually, we're currently watching the American version, which has a lot of swearing, ah. beeped out swearing, which oh, amuses my 10 year old. Of no course. <laughs> the most hilarious thing is the beep, beep, beep. <laughs> You know, the show is good and also it's very entertaining <laughs> to watch it with him. <laughs> so I'm going to make sure to do that. Yeah. Even if I could spend the evening working or cleaning yeah. or whatever else is kind of weighing on yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to make sure that, like, in general, the day is pretty good. It's like balancing the shoulds, like the stuff that you have to get done, with the stuff that brings you joy. It's and making sure you've got a mix. Like, you've still yeah. got to get stuff done. Awesome. And there's self-awareness there. Like yeah. I could have, eat, like today is a perfect example because I'm just really not having a good day. In fact, the day is so not good that I forgot about this podcast <laughs> recording with Holly. <laughs> and so she texted me and I'm like, oh yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I really don't have time to do this. But you know what? I'm going to do it because I know that talking to Holly about something like a little bit deeper and a little bit more meaningful yeah. is actually going to help me. <laughs> like it's going to make this day a lot better. And that's always, always, always my priority. And here we are talking about death. I know. <laughs> <laughs> is that lifting up your day? Is that bringing you joy? <laughs> it actually is lifting up my day. I good. feel like I'm contributing something. <laughs> good, good. So I think like my own midlife crises, experiences, like thoughts, and we'll talk, I guess, more in detail about various things a little bit later, but they've all led me to the same point as you were talking about, Holly, which is to make sure that like you're enjoying your life and that mm. you're creating as much as you can a life of joy and fulfillment, even yeah. if there are also elements that you wish were different or that you don't really care about as much or you don't really have passion for. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important is to find that balance. That's on coming to terms with mortality, I think. That's yeah. a really important aspect. And right now, the world kind of going in and out of coronavirus lockdowns, yeah. a lot of us have to be thinking about mortality because it's like there yeah. on the news and everywhere all the time. So I think this is a really good time to like reevaluate that piece mm. and really honest with yourself about whether this is the life you want to be living. And if not, like whose life are you living? Maybe you're living based on a parent's expectations or on choices that you made when you were like 18 and you've changed and now you want to make different choices and just change what you can. Like, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And step by step, you don't have to do like a total life overhaul. In fact, that's pretty difficult to do. So I'm getting ahead of myself here, but like make a list of all the things that make you unhappy. And pick one and like start with that. Like don't divorce your partner and quit your job yeah. and like start a new diet and like, I don't know. Don't try to do everything at once because yeah. that's totally overwhelming and that's probably not going to bring you too much joy. So as we were saying, I think there are various points that people do this at. Sometimes it's a significant birthday, 30, 40, 50. Sometimes it's a big life change. Like I remember when I turned 30 thinking I was very unhappy at the time and thinking, is this the rest of my life? And I didn't see a way out of the situation that I was in. And it took me another five years to get out of that situation. But that I remember at that birthday thinking, yeah. shit, is this the rest of my life? And then when I did, when I was 35-ish, get out of that situation, which was ex-partnership, that was kind of a midlife crisis for me. So I was about 35 at the time. And I just remember thinking I did throw everything away. Like it was like I'd split up for my partner and then I quit my business. And it was like I was at this point where I was like, shit, like that was when I started asking all the deep questions. Like, who am I? What do I want to be doing in my life? What can I do with my life? What skills do I have? I don't even know what skills I have because I'd been self-employed for 10 years and was just doing what needed to be done. That was kind of when I started having these thoughts and thinking like, what am I doing here? I mean, those questions are how I started as well. And yeah, like it could be like big things in your life. So when I had my son, as we just said, mm. like that led to a whole bunch of thinking and then eventually some changes once I had enough sleep to actually be able to function. But like last year, 
I had like a bout of midlife crisis mm. and it was actually triggered by my stepdaughter. No, so it wasn't last year, it was two years ago. My stepdaughter having a daughter. And I just like, I don't know, like for various reasons, which are personal and I don't want to really want to talk about, like I have one child, a son, right? Mm. And I don't know, maybe in an alternate universe, in a parallel universe, I would have had a bigger family. And it's always kind of, I don't know, like I could have made that choice though, and mm. I didn't. So it's a very kind of one of those kind of in between places where I haven't really chosen mm. super, super consciously, but my time ran out. Yeah. Right. So the trigger was this news. Well, obviously the news of the pregnancy, not the news of the actual child. Cause, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I just remember thinking, OK, like I'm now like far enough life or so old that this will never be my news again. Like, ah. I will never get the opportunity to, like, post on Facebook that I'm pre pregnant. Wow. Right? I will never have the opportunity to have another child or to have a daughter or, like, so there was a bunch of things. And I just started thinking about all the things that were suddenly closed to me. Not because, yeah. like, I have limited thinking, <laughs> yeah, limiting, yeah. limiting beliefs, but just because of the way life is. Mm. And I remember saying, and you remember this, Holly, because we just talked about it. I remember saying to Holly, I feel like you have all these milestones in life and I feel like all my happy ones are over. Oh, and I like now all I have to look forward to is like my son leaving the house and like my husband and I dying, my parents dying, everybody dying. And like all the remaining milestones are like are sad. Hmm. I remember you telling me that. and I was like, oh, shit, that's grim. Yeah. And I couldn't like shake it. Like, it was just one of these things that, like, hung over me for months and months and months. Like, this just, just coming to terms with it, I think that's all it needed. Because you can't ignore it. You can't talk yourself out of it. Like, that's kind of the way it is. And then so you have to kind of find your own happy milestones that you can still pay attention to or just pay attention to every day and find the little joys, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so, I don't know. Like, there's this trajectory of a happy life that we're taught to follow. Yeah. And it kind of goes up and up and up. But then it kind of starts going yeah. down, right? And I think that's why so many people have a midlife crisis, because you, it's expected. It is expected. Whereas I remember when you said that to me about how all your happy milestones were over with, I was like, shit, like I've had a non-traditional life, but like I was looking at life from a very different perspective. Like the first 35 years of my life were difficult and the, from 25 to 35 were shit. And I feel like all my shit is behind me. And I feel like all the good stuff is like now and in the future. Yeah, funny. Yeah, I think it was just something that was making me look at yeah. some things in my life. And again, just coming to terms with it, like coming to terms with my age and mm. the fact that despite what law of attraction says at the moment, you can't create every like anything you desire. Like I can't be 35 and super fertile again. <laughs> you know, like, so you're not so going to live to 567. Yeah. I mean, there are certain things you have to overcome. And last year was also my grandmother died. Mm. And I just had like a year of that <laughs> kind yeah. of thinking. Right. So but it was triggered not by like a super big event in my own life, but just by something happening. And then a, this thought going, oh, my gosh, like I will never get to do this again. Mm. So midlife can kind of appear in lots of different ways and it can feel lots of different ways as mm. well. And I don't think necessarily that like it happens and then you get over it. Mm. I think like it just changes the way you approach life mm. and your relationship with yourself and your life. And so it just progresses. And I think like you can have several trigger points. Yeah. I don't know. Like when I turn 50, that might trigger yeah. something as well. It might do. Well, and people also talk about the quarter life crisis. So apparently people in their 20s are also like experiencing crises. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's a thing too. I mean, it could happen at any point in your life. That's why I think calling it a midlife crisis or quarter life crisis or whatever, or like it could happen at any point, that point where you yeah. just stop and say, where am I and where do I want to be going? And what different choices do I need to make to get to where yeah. I want to go? So as we're talking, like I'm realizing that we talk about the midlife crisis as a like a terrible thing, yeah. like as like a not a good thing. And in fact, like when it comes to midlife crises for men, mm. like we make fun of that yeah. in jokes and on TV shows and whatever in popular culture. Right. Yeah. But in fact, a midlife crisis, whenever it strikes and however many times it strikes in your life is a fantastic thing mm. because it's asking you to reevaluate your life. Yeah 
to really to pause, right? Like it's just forcing you to pause and be like, this doesn't feel very good. Like, how can I feel better? Maybe I'll mm. buy a Ferrari. <laughs> like, oh, that, that didn't work. work. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun, but <laughs> right? Yeah. So <laughs> But I think it's a really useful thing. It's mm-hmm. a really useful place to be because it forces you to look at some stuff. Yeah. And then to make some changes, right? And to, again, like not everything all at once and not necessarily these giant life-altering things, but just making your life the way that if you look back at your life from your deathbed, that you would be like, oh, I led a really nice life and I'm really happy with the choices I made. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what does this look like when you're having midlife crisis, quarter life crisis, significant birthday crisis? Like, what does it look like? What does it feel like? How do you know when you're there? Oh, gosh, I think there's so many. I think like... And it's going to be different for everyone, obviously. Yeah, it's going to be different for everybody. So like, see what resonates with you. We have some examples and some various things that we have either experienced Mm. or know people who have experienced these things, but you can really experience it in lots of different ways. I think a common element is like this question of like, is it too late? Like, is it possible or is it too late? Like, yeah. maybe you feel like you're stuck. Oh, we're talking about, is it, it, is it too late or is it still possible? And that's something that, interestingly, mm. I've been thinking about as well, because there are so many trails that I want to hike and there are so many adventures that I want to have. And I've been making in my journal, like my hiking bucket list. And on Twitter, this guy who read one of my books has been giving me more trails. And like, I have all like so much stuff I want to do. And I feel like I don't have enough time. There are a lot of really challenging trails that I want to do, and I really kind of want to step up my level of adventure. And so there's this one trail that I've been reading about a lot lately called the Cape Wrath Trail, which is supposed to be one of the most challenging trails in Britain, not because of the technical aspect of the trail, but because it's so remote. And so I know, like, I've been reading a lot about it, and I've been got the guidebook, and I've been reading stuff online, and I've been reading people's journeys, and like, I'm so excited about it, but I feel like I have to do it soon, otherwise I'm going to be too old. And then I read this, it was like a trail journal of someone online who walked the trail. I think it was two women in their 60s. And I was like, oh, okay, so it can be done. Like, I don't need to rush to do it next year when I'm still 47. Like, it can be done. And I think I find it really useful to read other people's stories of stuff that they've done later in life. And like every time I read like a Camino de Santiago story where people are like crossing paths with this 70 year old person who's done it for to celebrate their 70th birthday or whatever, like great. Like that reminds me that I don't have such a limited amount of time to do my adventures and to walk my trails. Like I can keep doing this as long as I stay in shape and keep my body healthy. But yeah, I think that question that you ask, is it too late or is it still possible to do the things I want to do? Those are questions that can trigger a lot of anxiety around mid-age because it's like, shit, time is running out. I can't do it. You see, but that even like that assumes that you know what you want to do, which Mm, you do. Yeah. But like, what if you wake up in your 40s? Yeah. And you're like, oh, my gosh, like this isn't exactly the life I've been wanting, but I have no idea what I want. Yeah. So is it too late to find out? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the answer is it's not too late. Like, it's never too late, right? Like, anything you can do to make your life more fulfilling and more joyful is a good thing. (laughs) Like, even if you die tomorrow and today is a good day. Yeah, exactly. Your last day was a good day. Yeah. (laughs) That's what you need to do that guided... approach to life. (laughs) (laughs) That's why you need to do that guided meditation on the deathbed. (laughs) I might do, actually. Maybe not as gruesome as what you were describing. (laughs) Put some um, funeral music in the background, like organs. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, no. You're not going to produce this for me, Holly. I think I'm going to go a different creative direction. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, okay. So, so what does it look like? What does it look like? It, it's like when you're stuck in life. Like when I quit my first business at 35-ish, I was stuck. Like I didn't know where I wanted to go. I didn't know what I was good at. All I knew was what I didn't want. Because for so many years, I'd been thinking about what I didn't want, and I'd been living what I didn't want. Like, my mind was moving away from what I didn't want, but I didn't know what I wanted instead. It was like, you were moving toward. Exactly. Like, I'm running away from this thing that I hate, but where am I going? Just away. What am I going to? Yeah. For me, it felt like less like stuck, but more like not growing. So, like, I just felt like I wasn't developing or, yeah, or just growing. And I also didn't know what I wanted to grow towards. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to grow into. into. 
But like, I've always really valued learning and Mm. personal development, personal growth. And I felt like that was like, none of that was happening. So like every day was the same as the last and nothing ever happened that was remotely interesting or important. And it was just terribly unfulfilling and boring. Mm. I was bored. Mm. So maybe not stuck, but bored for yeah. me. Like it was just like this. It's like the monotony of life and routine. Yeah, the monotony, exactly, exactly. Like the mundane every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so tough. it can definitely feel like that. <laughs> and I think a lot of people are feeling like the people that stop and think, "Whose life am I living?" They're probably stuck in shitty, same day, same everything. Nothing's different. Nothing's fun. That's where you ask yourself, like, is this it? Is this all there is? Shouldn't there be more? Yeah. And the thing is, the problem is that the more isn't like a bigger house or Mm. another child or anything external. Mm. The more I have come to the conclusion anyway, that the more comes from within. Mm. And so for me, the more definitely came once I learned about soul connection and intuition and like learned more about myself, Mm. all that inner stuff that Mm -hmm. like self-love, all the things that like I never wanted to do because I wanted to do stuff, not like think about self-love, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Well, that's the thing because we're taught when we're younger to achieve these external things like the partner, the kid, the house, the job, the money, but we're not taught how to achieve the internal bits. Or even that it's important. Yeah. Like, or even that it's, it exists. Because or even that it exists. Because you think that's going to come from achieving the external stuff. And so it's no wonder, like, it's kind of like society set up like this mm. to continue. Well, it is. I mean, this is mm. a slightly different topic, but like, It is set up like that, like Mm. consumerism, capitalism, like it is set up like that. It's set up so that you think that buying stuff will make you feel better, so that you buy stuff and that's how the economy works, Mm. Mm. (laughs) which is shocking. But yeah, so the thing is, like when you're feeling that way, you know, shouldn't there be more? Is this all there Mm. is? The kind of natural reaction is to like get a new project Mm. and like remodel your house. Or try to get the next level at your job or... Yeah, and concentrate on those external things. And I think that's just a path to like unfulfillment and mm-hmm. dissatisfaction, yeah. discontent, really, because like you can't keep that going, like it's not sustainable. And so in the parts of your life when like that energy drops, and there isn't a new project, or the new project isn't moving or whatever, mm-hmm. you're just going to be stuck with whatever's within. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's still going to be there. It's not going to have changed, right? Yeah, it's a recipe really for life dissatisfaction. Yeah. And that's really sad, I think, because that's really the life recipe that we're taught. Yeah, it is. It is. And I think that's why so many people get to the point where they're like, I'm so unfulfilled. Like, I've done all the right things, but yet it's not working. And then you think there's something wrong with you, right? Because you've done all the right things. Yeah. You don't know what else you want. And what's wrong with you that you're not satisfied with all the things that everyone else has and that you want and that everyone wants? And your life is so good. You have a house. You have a good mortgage. You've got a good kid. Like, shouldn't you be satisfied with that? And that's where I think a lot of guilt comes in for a lot of people. Like, I should be satisfied with this. Yeah, like I should be happy Mm. living in this situation and taking care of my kids and Mm. whatever. And here I am, like, thinking about passion and how to add some passion and joy to my life because I'm Mm. a bit bored. Yeah. Especially as a woman, I think. Yeah. It's certainly, we get the message that like that shouldn't happen, that Mm. you should be complete. I know I'm bringing it back to motherhood again, but like that message is so strong Mm. in society that like that should be like ultimately fulfilling Mm. that it's hard not to bring it back to that in terms of this conversation. Yeah. Well, and Um, I think it, I think it is fulfilling for a lot of people, but I think it is unfulfilling for a lot of people. Like for some people, it's not what they thought it was going to be. Yeah, or not like everything. I think like it's even if it's fulfilling, like I find motherhood for fulfilling, right? Mm. Like certainly after we got off over the baby stage, <laughs> which I didn't particularly enjoy. I think it's a very fulfilling part of my life, probably the most amazing part of my life if I compare to other parts, right? But it's not all that I am. Mm. And so I'm still allowed to desire passion and joy from other parts, Or I'm still allowed to seek out experiences that fulfill a different part of me, the Mm non-mother part of me. Yeah. And I think that's what we lack. Like there's no space in life for all those different parts. Mm -hmm. And when you reach one of those midlife points, that's what happens. Like you've been concentrating on one and that's not all you are. Yeah. Probably the answer is really quite simple, right? You're probably 
not spiritually connected, you're Mm -hmm. probably not making space for creativity. And you're probably not making space for fun and joy. Like the answers are always pretty much the same. Yeah. Right. Because those are the things that people always report, like not having enough time for Mm. time for me, for self-care, like to read a book, for creativity, to create something. I've always wanted to write a novel or I've always wanted to learn how to paint or those are the things. Yeah. So how does it feel when you're in this place where you're needing to reevaluate? As you said, boredom, like you feel bored. You're searching for passion. You feel unfulfilled. Another thing is that that sense of loss, like half of my life slipped away from me and I wasn't making conscious decisions. I wasn't consciously creating my life. Like, shit, I lost half my life. I don't definitely don't feel like that now, but like, I do feel like I lost like 10 years of my life. And even before that, because I wasn't really clear about what I wanted. It was like stuff just happened to me. I mean, I think like that could even be a separate conversation. And interestingly, we're recording this on World Forgiveness Day. Oh, are we? And I think that what you've just described is an element of like it has an element of forgiveness to it. It's kind of like making peace with the choices you made and the life path that you had and kind of not going there Mm. (laughs) to that sense of loss because it's it's pointless right like the only thing we can do is redirect forward exactly and I totally understand what you're talking about you know last year I took control of my finances for the first time in my life and I was hanging out with all these women who like had been investing and buying property and all sorts of things and I was just like oh my god like it's too late Mm. (laughs) like this is all like fantastic And I wish I'd found it 20 years earlier. Like, I'm too late to the party. Like, even if I start this and it all comes to fruition in like 45 years, it's going to be a bit late. (laughs) And so to also practice some forgiveness and all that for decisions that I made or didn't make when I was younger, that could have had a different effect. But I think we all end up in a certain place for certain reasons as well. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How else does it feel? Sometimes I think of myself as an old person. I try not to, like, I'm very aware of this thought because I know that thoughts create my reality. And so I don't want to be an old person. And so, like, when I find myself thinking that way, I do something that will turn it around. So, like, I'll go running and prove to myself my body's still strong or Mm. I'll do something that feels, like, young. (laughs) Yeah. Or that I have associated with being young in some way because I just don't think that's useful either. No, 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 no. And I know people who have thought of themselves as old from the moment they Mm. turned 40. And that's just not a nice way to live, I think. Constantly kind of reminding yourself of like not being able to do the things you used to do. And so there you go. If you think of yourself as an old person, don't. (laughs) (laughs) Do do things that counteract that, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's rough. It also feels like or it could feel like you think your best years are behind you. And this is what happened with me and my milestones, that all my Mm -hmm. good milestones have passed. And it's just an interesting point about kind of point of view. You can always look at things from a different perspective. And like I was feeling like my best years were behind me at that particular time. I always have this memory of my mom saying, completely unrelated, because I didn't tell her what I was thinking. But she said to me, oh, she said, it's so great. You're really on the cusp of the best years of your life. <laughs> I'm like, like from her point of view, 30 years forward, I'm on the cusp of something. I'm at the beginning of something. Yeah. And in my point of view, I was at the end. Yeah. Both are true. And it's really up to you which one you focus on, right? Mm. So that really changed my mind about it. I think it can help also to read people's stories. Like it's so easy to see now, like with the internet, so many young people being successful from really young ages. But there are also a lot of people who didn't get successful until they were in their 40s, 50s, 60s. A lot of people have replanned their lives at mid age and only then become successful. So I think it could be also really useful to find those examples to remind yourself that you can still change things around and do the things you want to do. Yeah, or just be happy, right? Like there are also examples, like you don't have to do stuff. There are also examples of people who had pretty miserable first parts of their life and then were happier in their mid and later years. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to notice, you know, like I always notice when I go to the park, Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because of my obsession with death, but I always... (laughs) an old age, but like, I notice like when there's a couple Mm. of people in there and 
70s, 80s, I don't know. And they're walking together and they're holding hands. Yes, I like that. I always notice it. I'm like, wow, like romance is still alive, right? Or like today I was in the park for a walk. There was a couple, they were older and she was on her bike and he was running next to her. Oh. And I was like, that is so cool. Like to do like a physical activity, you know, a physical outdoor activity like that later in life. I just like to see the examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's like my husband always says now, he's like, every time I go for a run now, I'm investing in my health at a later age. That's true. I'm going to say that about walking because I can't be bothered usually. Yeah. Yeah, And that really changed my perspective for me because I want to be active. I want to keep doing walks. I want to keep having adventures, like physical adventures later in life. So how do I do that? I invest now in my future health. Yeah. And of course, like you enjoy that stuff, right? So it's important to know. Like just to note that when you're making your own list of things that you want to do or feel more of or whatever, like just keep in mind that like Holly is very outdoorsy. And so that's what she's going to want to have more of in her life. And if that's not you, like it's not me, (laughs) (laughs) then like you don't have to put that on your list, right? Right. Like just a reminder, because I think it's easy to like look for formulas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in these things. And that's the thing. You have to create your own formula. And I think that's why it's so challenging for a lot of people. And I think that's why a lot of people don't do it. Yeah. So how do you know when it's time to pause and reevaluate? Well, any of those feelings, I think like if you're feeling pretty crappy about your life (laughs) then make space, right? I mean, I think that's a choice. Like we kind of tend to think that we don't have a choice, that we just feel Mm. crappy because of this or this or this external stuff, Mm. you know, the world's going to shit and like whatever, like whatever you, you blame for your dissatisfaction, but it's an opportunity, you know, and you need to, I think, sit down and ask yourself, like, how can I best move forward so that... I can experience something else. And as I shared with you before, like for me, that was getting out of my comfort zone and taking an intuitive art class Mm -hmm. that led me to more soul connection and eventually to like a whole new business Mm -hmm. and a whole new path in life and more abundance than I ever thought possible and all sorts of things. But it started with like this really small decision Mm -hmm. to take this intuitive art class without knowing what it was going to create. It was time for me. It was one Saturday a month when my son was very small. Yeah, lots of guilt involved, you know, lots of stuff. That was my time. So I made that space in my life to get to know me more and all that. And that's how you start. You have to make the space. And I think that's a good point. Like you had to make a sacrifice and sometimes you're going to have to make a sacrifice and sometimes it's not going to be easy. And sometimes you're going to feel guilty about it. But if you want things to be different... You've got to take a different action, even if that's uncomfortable. And it might be uncomfortable because you might be going out of your comfort zone. For sure. And I think like finding that space is difficult for everybody. Everybody's busy. Everybody has full Mm -hmm. lives. So if you're reacting to this by saying, oh, there's no way I can do anything like that. It's not true. Yeah, I agree. I recently wrote this short reads book called How to Add More Adventure to Your Life. When I wrote that, I was very intentionally putting small adventures as well as big adventures And so a lot of the things I had were also like, if you feel like you don't have enough time for you to feel, eat something different, like cook a new recipe, like you've got to eat. So instead of cooking the same thing, like cook something different, try a new ingredient. I brought it down to really simple, tiny micro adventures. And I was reading this review I got of the book the other day because I'd sent out some review copies to people. And this woman, I'm assuming, wrote a review saying, it was a great book, lots of ideas, but unfortunately I can't do any of them. Because I'm too busy or something like that. And I'm like, do you get, get ah, ah. <laughs> Like, take responsibility for your life. Like, you can cook a different recipe. Like, yeah. it takes you five minutes to go online, Google a recipe, it takes a few more yeah. minutes to buy this stuff. But, like, you can always do something differently. I know what it feels like when you really feel like you can't. Yeah. Like, that certainly was me. Like, I remember, like, my first kind of receiving coaching experiences mm-hmm. when coaches would say, take half an hour and yeah. do this and this. And I'd be like, are you crazy? Where am I going to find half an hour? Yeah. You know, like, that's just insane. So eventually I started with five minutes. Yeah. And I've built that up. Eventually I built it up into, a, like, a mindset, energy, alignment, intuitive practice hmm. that's very, very regular. 
And that can be done like in these really small chunks. And that's kind of one of the things that I specialize in is helping people fit that stuff into their life. And like, I have a whole course on this called the high vibe experiment, actually, mm. <laughs> that gives you 20 prompts of like a small, short thing to do to get into the zone, boost your energy, <laughs> feel better, basically. Yeah. And these are my own tools. Like that's all I did is share the things that I do, mm. either preemptively <laughs> Or when I notice that my energy is going down or I'm not feeling fulfilled or I'm not feeling good about my life. And these things can be done in five, 10 minutes a day. Mm. And honestly, if you can't find five, 10 minutes a day, then do five, 10 minutes every other day. Yeah. Or once yeah. a week. Yeah. Start and then you build you up. That's one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever received is do the best you can with yeah. what you have at hand. Like Absolutely. instead of waiting for everything to be perfect or to have more time or for your kids to be older or like for whatever it is. Start now and do the best you can with what you have right now. Mm -hmm. And exactly. it'll build. Like, I promise, I don't make many promises, but I promise that it will be life changing and you will be able to build on it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, when you're in that place, you're having a crisis, so you're feeling you have to reevaluate. Everything feels shitty and bored. And, well, how do you be happy when you're in that place? Like, how do you make that shift from everything is crap to okay, but it could be better. How do you find that passion for life? I think slowly, unfortunately, that's probably the answer. It's kind of just being willing, first being willing to admit that something's wrong and that there is a possibility to change it. So looking for proof, as we said before, that things yeah. can be different. One of the earliest kind of memories in my own journey of like changing my life around was reading Oprah's magazine. And she had this article on this woman who used to be like a financial advisor or something like in a big financial, big company, whatever. And then she started, she was creative and she started designing wallpaper hmm. and she ended up quitting her job and setting up this business designing wallpaper. Wow. And she was featured in Oprah's magazine. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, like people do this. Hmm. People leave careers that they've been building for years and years mm. and like they can be successful like mm. it's possible i just remember mm. like the thing yeah. and really honestly like when i talk about it i'm back there in that moment mm -hmm. reading this article going it's possible to choose for creativity in a simpler life and yes i know that sometimes it doesn't work mm. but mm -hmm. look sometimes it does yeah but that's right? the thing it's a gamble and it's scary and it's so hard to leave the familiar the secure the stuff that you know works, except does it, and then leave that for something that's like a total gamble. Like it might work, it might not work, uh, who knows? You don't need to. Like not yeah. everybody needs to like set up their own creative wallpaper company, right? Yeah, not me. <laughs> no, not me <laughs> But you might want to set up a blog. Yeah. And write about motherhood. Mm. Just connect with other people. Mm. Oh, this is one of the things I did when I, like, in one of my many midlife crisis moment type things, <laughs> I set up a book blog. Mm. I had this, like, immense sense, I remember, of, like, not doing anything interesting in my life. And, like, for me, not work-wise, yeah. but for me. So I set up this book blog. And it was, like, it was a lifeline to me. Mm. Like, whenever things got stressful in my life or at work, like, this was a whole other community where I was part of something that was very, very different, where I was like, liked, just mm. because I talked about books. <laughs> yeah. Like I didn't achieve anything or prove anything. <laughs> I just needed to show up. I made a lot of really good friends mm. through that. And it really, really helped me to kind of add some joy to my life. I mean, obviously, for that, you need to like writing and you need to like yeah. some things. So this, this, again, isn't the choice for everybody. But there's always something that you can add. So slowly, start adding space for yourself, space for self discovery. Yeah. And start adding more things that feel good. Hmm. And it'll snowball. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's just taking that one step to something that you like, whether it's reading, writing, cooking, walking, whatever. Whatever. Do and just something. do more of it. Yeah. Just do more of it. But I think like to truly come out the other side of like a midlife moment, that's a nice term, midlife mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. I think like it requires more than just doing stuff that you like. I think it also like that's one part. Like I would say there are two things. One is to add more things that you like, more mm. joy, more of that. 
And the other, I think it's really important to put aside some time for self-discovery, for journaling on questions, yes. on prompts, and like the ones that I do with weekly and monthly messages that I channel, or get yourself a book of prompts. There's mm, loads of books. There's yes, tons. Prompts. Just something like to help you discover yourself again and learn to like yourself again. And that's what's going to lead you to like the bigger picture of mm. what your passions are and what your life, like what you want your life to look like. But you have yeah. to like get to know yourself first again. Because I think like what happens is all that society stuff, like it just buries who you mm. really are and what you really want. And so when you stop and you realize that you're not super happy, it's impossible to see what's underneath all those layers. You can't. You have to like take them off and yeah. probe a little bit. Yeah. So know yourself. And that doesn't happen overnight either, but start. You just got to take action. You've got to take responsibility for your own life. I think that's the big mindset shift between letting stuff happen to you and creating the life that you want and yeah. finding that passion again in life. Yeah, that was certainly the key moment for me that really got me started was realizing that it was possible to create something different. Mm -hmm. Whether that was through energy and yeah. law of attraction stuff and whatever, you know, all those things, or through different choices, mm -hmm. that it was actually possible yeah. to create something different. And once I realized that it was possible, mm -hmm. I started to find examples like the story in Oprah's magazine, yeah. where I was like, oh my gosh, like, look at her, she did create something different. And yeah. then I started thinking, what are my steps? Yeah. How can I create something different? And yeah. here we are, <laughs> completely Yay. different life. Yeah. Just seven or eight short years. <laughs> it takes time. It take might take years, but like, it's not like everything's shitty up until all of a sudden it's not. Like, it's a journey of feeling better and better and better and better and better and better and better. And, better and, better and then, woo, everything's amazing. But it's getting better. It's not like you still have yeah, to yeah. suffer. Well, yeah, as long as you're choosing for it yeah, to be better exactly. every day. So that's <laughs> yeah. another thing that I talk about a lot that we're not going to get into here, which is to not sacrifice today yeah. for the sake of tomorrow, which means choosing to lead a better life today. I think my morbid way is the best way to think about it. Like hmm. if this was your last day on earth, yeah. if it was your actually your last day on earth and you were aware of that, you might not do some of the things that you think you should be doing, Yeah, like show up for work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But like still show up yeah. <laughs> and aside from that, what could you add to today to make this a really nice day for yourself? Mm. And, and do it. it. Yay. Do it. All right. Well, I think that was pretty complete. I think so. Lots to think about. So yes. if there's anything that you want to ask or clarify, then feel free to get in touch. You can mm. reach me on any of the social media channels. I'm Joanna Hennen. And I'm Holly Wharton at Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Holly at hollywharton.com if you want to email. All right. So thank you and good luck. Yeah. Yay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. And please drop me a line. Let me know what you thought about this topic. You can email me at holly at hollywharton.com or find me online and get in touch there. I would love to give you a shout out on the show. I would love to hear from you also love to know what you want me to talk about, whether it's me on my own or Joanna or whatever, what topics are of interest to you. Finally, remember to visit hollywharton.com forward slash 366 for the show notes on this episode. And in a couple weeks, as always, the transcript will be up. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Have a fantastic week. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed, at hollywharton.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-R-T-O-N.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.